Welcome to Mistar for the latest video in our deep dive into the known world. Today is a creature feature where we look at the various threats and villains in desert regions. People playing Yalarm or Send, listen up because this is going to impact you first and foremost. When I was putting together this video I realized that several of the creatures on this list have already been done, so they will get a summary rather than going into great detail. While breaking down creatures by category, there's always a bit of overlap, and the more videos I do, the more overlap I face. I'm Mr. Welch, and today we're meeting Sandy Franks, the source of all our pain. Monsters I've already covered that would qualify for Desert Dwellers are the Cystic, the Dragon, and the Flame Drake. The Cystic are the Desert Scourge, a race of matriarchal reptilian humanoids found in the deep deserts of Yalarum. They're highly organized, with all the warriors being female, as male Cystic are larger and dim-witted, perfect for physical labor but not combat. They fight humans for territory and threaten the Sultan's forces. Dragons are a magical combination of lion and gold dragon, so blame the Nithians. They are beasts, pure and simple, sporting a magical roar, and are quite clever. Flame Drakes were added in the second edition and are a type of dragonkin, like a smaller red dragon, but nowhere near as dangerous. Now we're done with the recap, and it's time for the new blood. First up is the Desert Ghost, and despite the name, this creature is an elemental rather than undead, traveling from the plane of Earth during heavy sandstorms during their immature phase. In this form, they resemble motes of dust that spark with electricity and float on the desert air. Any contact with metal kills them and does 1d6 damage to anyone holding or wearing metal. While that sounds annoying, they're typically found in groups of 10. One desert ghost baby is a nuisance. A cloud of them is 10d6 damage, no save. They are intelligent creatures with an instinctive hatred of metal and those who use it during this phase. They have four hit dice, so try to kill them from a distance with magic, but that isn't as easy as you think. The actual danger is sandstorms, where they will be drawn by the hundreds or thousands in truly monstrous storms. It is in these storms that the desert ghosts mature into their humanoid forms. Adult forms of the creatures look like featureless humanoids comprised of sand. They still cause electrical damage on contact, but it doesn't kill them automatically. They still take damage, but they will deal more damage than they take. They are immune to non-metal weapons, heal from electrical attacks, and are highly fire resistant. Water burns them like oil, making them quite hostile to their attacker. Desert ghosts aren't ordinarily aggressive in this form. They want to walk around the desert and do desert stuff. If you avoid them, they ignore you. Watch out for the larger sandstorms where they tend to congregate. One of the most dangerous events in Yalarum is when a large sandstorm engulfs a village as it brings the desert ghosts along with it where they start fires and injure the population. The desert leviathan is less of a monster and more of a plot device. It's the sandworm from Dune. I'm not going to disguise it. It's hundreds of feet long, has 70 hit dice, it's immune to all magic that doesn't do straight up damage, and it takes half damage from everything without exception. You're not killing it. It burrows under the sand, waits for somebody to walk over its mouth, and then it just goes, ah. Everybody has to make a saving throw at minus four or get eaten. It can't eat creatures larger than 30 feet across, so in 5e terms, that includes everything including the smaller gargantuan creatures. There's an even larger and fully aquatic version that can swallow up the Tarrasque as it can eat creatures 50 feet across. This also includes many sailing ships. Assuming the 5th edition book you're using gives actual sizes for boats. The Leviathan only has one job, eat everything at once. It's really good at that job. Once swallowed, you take 4d12 damage automatically, but at least weapons and spells are no longer penalized. You have to survive for 10 rounds. After that, it spits you out after dealing 40d12 damage, not counting the 3d12 bite damage you took on the way down. You can't kill this thing. Your arm will get tired before you get it to half hit points, assuming it just doesn't dive under the sand. The Mistaran Lamara is not the Lamara in other lesser settings. Suppose you listen to the lies told by people of Orth or Faerun. In that case, the Lamara is just another name for the Lamia, a creature with the upper torso of a woman and the lower part of some beast of indeterminate origin. In Mistara, they are the true snake people, with an upper torso of a human of either sex and a snake's tail. They can't speak, but they can create illusions at will. They can charm members of the opposite sex. And their favorite tactic is to create a large illusionary creature to distract their victim while they attack from behind. If pressed, they can constrict with their tail for hefty damage and can sustain an attack for constant damage. Be glad that these things are only ever found alone. Zytars are six-legged reptilian creatures with a snake-like neck and the ability to breathe fire. They hunt in packs and have a sizable amount of hit points to boot. They will always open with their fire breath weapon and again use it one-third of the time in combat. They are trained by the Cystics as attack animals, but wild Zytars will often stalk human settlements and pick off stragglers or small groups. They are immune to non-magical fire and automatically pass all saving throws from fire-based spells. They can also go weeks without water, but they prefer to feed rather often. The Desert Hydra is a variant found in today's terrain de jour, but it is most numerous in the Great Waste. They're ambush predators, waiting for prey to pass over before attacking with all their heads. 
They will pursue prey after the initial attack, leaving victims killed at first behind and dragging further kills back to the ambush site to feed. They're vicious creatures, even for a Hydra, but other than better armor class and a more aggressive demeanor, they're essentially the same as other types of Hydras. The Jinn are usually friendly and fun to be around in Mystara. The Sultans of Yalarim have often entertained one at court. Tales of Jinn advisors to Sultans are similar and not uncommon in the Emirates. They can even be forced into servitude, willingly or unwillingly, and without much fuss, but it's always better to pay the Jinn so there's no hard feelings afterwards. You have to watch out for the Pashas, one of the Jinn nobility, and the ones sent if someone is harassing or hunting Jinn on the Prime material plane. You will know if you've crossed the line when a Pasha appears. They look like normal Jinn, except they're about ten times larger than the standard varieties. They have all the abilities of the common Jinn, except they can use the spell-like abilities at will instead of just three times a day. They are immune to plus two or lesser weapons and regenerate quickly. They get access to multiple air spells like Cloud Kill, Weather Control, and Water to Gas, but once per day. They do get the ability to grant wishes, again once per day, but only for other people. When they're really pissed, they go Tornado on the target of their ire. This massive column of twisting air kills creatures of five hit dice or less on a failed save, and the creatures need to make that save each round. They can keep this ability up for ten rounds, inflicting 3d12 damage each time. They can plane shift at will back to the plane of air or the ethereal plane, so killing one is difficult on top of all their normal defenses. They can't be summoned with most spells, and only the most powerful magic items will have any effect on them at all. They are loath to appear on the prime plane, so don't expect them to pull out the Robin Williams impersonation if they have to make an appearance. On the flip side, there's the Ifrit Amir. These guys aren't as impressive as the Pashas, only appearing about twice as tall as a normal Ifrit. They are more common than Pashas on Mastara, but even then their visits are still rare. While they prefer the desert, the wealthiest Amirs will sometimes vacation on Honor Island in Irindi. As most Ifrit nobles are richer than mortal comprehension, that gives you an idea of how expensive Honor Island can be for creatures from the Plane of Fire. They are usually in Mastara to avenge some slight against normal Ifrit. They can't be summoned by spells, and like the Pashas, can't be affected by magic items short of relics. The Emirs are just like regular Ifrit in combat, but more burny. They can appear as giant Ifrit, or pillars of fire that you can't put out. They can also punch you in this form, adding fire damage to their normal attack. They can use any normal Ifrit ability at will, and cast Wish once per day for somebody else, and they get some fire spells once per day. They aren't as impressive as Pashas, but they are far more aggressive. You might be able to reason with a Jin Pasha. The Ifrit Amir is only interested in watching you burn. The giant Tuatara lizard is just like the average Tuatara lizard, only bigger. That's why we call it the giant one. It's a standard animal type with its only special ability being Infravision. They aren't exactly a threat to characters. Despite their increased hit dice, their damage output is poor, and they're generally found in pairs at best. They serve as more window trappings when the players see exotic wildlife when they enter a new area. They aren't used as guard animals, and while they might threaten a low-level party, their morale means they aren't going to stick around long if the fight even begins to look like it's going against them. The Camarilla is composed of a bunch of mopey would-be goths sitting around at night wondering how they can score with the tall blonde chick with all the silver jewelry. Or they would be if we were playing a different game. Returning to the days before the Great Reign of Fire, you will find the Camarilla Lizard in the desert south of Blackmore. They have the exact same stats as the Zytar, the same body type, the same coloration, the same number of attacks, and... Wait a minute, they just crossed off Zytar and wrote Camarilla in this monster entry for Blackmore City of Gods. So exactly like my bard's backstory, where he was responsible for singing Rock Me Amadeus along with several other Austrian pop hits in the 80s. They didn't even try to hide it. They put it in a poorly received module back in 87 during the Gazetteer era, with the Zytar appearing in the first creature catalog in 86. Why they did a name change, I have no idea, but this is a weird one to find in a lore dive. The Sand Folk also appeared in City of the Gods, but they are original creations, not appearing in any other modules. And because of their utterly alien biology, even for Mastara, the vaults speculate that they're an alien creature like the crew of the Beagle. They are seven foot tall, four armed silicon based lifeforms, found only in desert climates and mainly to the south of Blackmoor, like the Camarillo and or Zytar. They have a tribal society with a fair degree of complexity. They are a warrior race, and all members are expected to fight. One curious aspect of their biology is extreme heat causes the sand folk to change sex, unless a female is already pregnant. This only happens in the harshest summers. Another heat wave will cause the sex change to revert. In years of chaotic weather, the sand folk can switch genders multiple times. They thrive in the desert. They can practically turn invisible when waiting in ambush, making detecting them impossible. They can feel vibrations on the sand and even in the wind patterns, so surprising them in their home terrain is a fool's errand. They are quite strong and view strength as a measure of leadership. This can be quite dangerous, as losing too many battles is a death sentence for tribal leaders. Their only punishment is the death penalty, and anything deemed not punishable by death is allowed. 
They find physical labor beneath them and will take what they want unless they're on friendly terms with an outsider. They are consummate liars when dealing with outsiders, but not with others of their own kind. They will trade with other races, but only if they can't take what they want by force. That concludes the rundown on the desert creatures of Mastara, minus the one I'm saving for a future creature feature. I have no idea why they recycled the Zytar for City of the Gods as another creature, and I can't exactly ask Arneson now. I'm hesitant to look up creatures of the Arctic, as I've started to run out of monsters I can easily categorize. Come back next week for a treat as we're headed back to the past for a retro run, looking at adventures in Zero AC, the time of the Thaetian Revolution, and what's going on with the rest of the world. Until then, it's time to get off that horse with no name.